So there are a couple of ways to try and pick out these moving lines. And as with many situations like this, the best thing to do is to be able to mark your discoveries on the page as you make them, which will require that you either print out the score or be able to mark the score via a PDF editor or a preview editor or something like that. Uh, may seem like a bit of an extra hassle, but it can really make a difference in your learning efficiency. So I do highly recommend it. As I tell all of my students, real musicians mark on their music. And I'll leave it at that. So let me play this first system for you again. Let's take these first two measures here and break them down to what we want to see. Now here, we've removed all of the repeating notes, leaving only the moving lines. So pretty much all of the piece can be broken down like this. And in some cases, you'll discover that some of the measures only consist of a couple of different notes. Now, there are two ways to mark this on the score that makes sense. One is to mark the first iteration of repeating notes vertically, as you're seeing highlighted here. And the second is to mark the lines that move constantly throughout the eighth note repetitions with horizontal lines like this. Now, these two ways of highlighting are covering the beats um, that just change on the first part of the beat and then repeat, and then also the lines going through all of the notes of the beat. Now let's jump down and reapply this process to the second system, where we have a bit more activity. So let me first play it again for you. Try to see if you can hear and see um, what we're going to be trying to aim for through all of these repetitions. Let's first apply our vertical highlights which we're going to put on the first eighth notes of any of the beats that simply repeat throughout. So you can see for all of these beats in measure three, the notes just set themselves on the first eighth note and then repeat throughout. So let's put our highlights on the first eighth notes here for each beat. Now you can see in measure four, we have two sets of moving through lines, uh, one in the right hand happening under this repeated line of A's and the other in the left hand happening above a line of A's. So let's put some horizontal highlights on both of those, giving us something that looks like this. Finally, let's do what we did earlier and subtract from the score all of the repeated notes, leaving us with only our highlighted moving notes. So once again, this is one of those analytical processes that can really work for you if you put in the effort to make it happen. And going through and marking this piece um, with all of this info will really let you see um, these big picture elements more easily, making your learning process that much more efficient. Okay, so now let's shift gears and talk about a bit of the opposite. Now we're actually going to talk about how to play all of the repeating notes. And this is important because there is a bit of potential for tension here, um, specifically in the practicing process. Now, as you'll be doing this over and over again to try and learn it, it's such a repetitive motion that you'll be using that you really do want to try and avoid as much tension as possible. But the piece itself is short, and once you can play through it, you'll have no problem. But practicing up to that point could put some tension in your wrists and hands, and we want to try to avoid that. Well, fortunately, because the motion is mostly the same, and because there are some natural tension releases, built into the music. Uh, anytime you're only playing one note or anytime you get to switch fingers to play the moving lines, you're transferring the tension away from what you've been repeating. Um, you can focus on a fairly singular train of thought. So in short, we don't want to play with stiff wrists and we want to avoid trying to play with our fingers alone. So we don't want this and we don't want this. As you might imagine, we're going for something of a hybrid, whereby we have slightly flexible wrists that are not floppy, and fingers that are similarly loose but supported, not floppy. Now there's an analogy that's regularly used to describe how you want to think about your wrists and fingers for this sort of thing, um, that you should think of them as being like shock absorbers or like uh, suspension on a car. Um, and in this case, it's really not a bad way to think about things. 
You want to think about the energy as coming from your arms, um, being delivered to the keys through your fingertips with a gentle flex in both your wrists and fingers to keep them from building tension through stiffness. Thanks for watching this lesson from Liberty Park Music. If you enjoyed this lesson and learned something from it, do us a favor, hit that like button. And if you really liked it, share it around. Let your friends and family check it out too. If you want to find more lessons like this or explore other piano-related topics, please come visit us at libertyparkmusic.com. We have full piano courses ranging from beginner to more advanced levels, and everything is online and streaming 24-7 so that you can design your music learning around your schedule and learn in the comfort of your own home from a talented roster of professional teachers and musicians. Come check us out.